Hello, and welcome to the Beautifully Human podcast. I'm Nick Sheesby. In this podcast, I speak with beautiful humans from all around the world, sharing with you their incredible stories, revealing the power in every human story to spread love and humanity to a world that is in desperate need of it, to show that we can all connect in beautiful ways, no matter where we come from or what we look like. What you will find out is that we are all beautifully human. Let's all be beautifully human. How's it going? Hey, Paul. <laughs> I think I got it this time. I think hopefully, as long as I don't move too much, which I can't promise. That's all right. I wiggle around. I, think we'll I, move, I move a bunch. Um, it's kind of fitting for 2020, you know, figuring out the little those little weird technology quirks. Yeah, exactly. So how you doing, brother? Good. How about you? I'm a. Damn. I actually had a really. I took a five days off. Well, obviously we got Christmas off and then whatever else. But I took a couple of days off, so it gave me five days off in a row, and it was great to uh, do nothing. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Where? What do you? Where do you work? I work at a medical equipment distributor. Um, I am the well, one of the data specialists. So I basically put the product information on the website like when you go to something like amazon.com and you look at the product and it has the description and the specs and the images like i put that on oh. a medical equipment website so you guys have been busy this year yes <laughs> <laughs> everybody i was very fortunate when other people were you know uh losing their job and things that i was in an industry and an environment where i had no concerns whatsoever sure yeah So where are you located at? I live in uh, Rhode Island. Oh, okay, cool. What part? Um, Warwick. Oh, right on. Cool. It's uh, central, I believe. Rhode Island's so small, you can travel the whole thing in like two hours. So yeah, I was going to say. Not like, <laughs> it's not like, you know, I have to get too crazy descriptive for you to be able to find me. Yeah, just just put a little dot in the middle there. That's cool. I uh, I've yeah. been to Providence quite a few times, but I don't. I I'm probably no, Providence is pretty cool. I've I've probably driven through Warwick. I've I've been just like crossing paths through Rhode Island. Um. Well, the airport is in Warwick, so if you ah, flew, yeah, for sure you went to Warwick. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Very cool. Well, man, I was listening to to you uh, to you all's podcast. I really I really enjoyed it so far. I, um, I'm glad. Thank you. I, um, I, I first, the first one I, I clicked on was the one where you all were going into the Baptists, uh, uh, the, oh, uh, the, IFB. <laughs> the IFB. Yeah. Cause funny yeah. enough, I, I actually, for a brief semester, I went to Liberty in, uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, mm -hmm. which is, I'm sure, you know, is Falwell's school. <laughs> Mm -hmm. all those fun places right oh my lord yeah it was you know i grew i didn't grow up baptist but it was it was just strange my dad it was the only school that he would pay for me to go to he said well you can go to school anywhere you want but uh if you if you want me to pay for it i'll pay for liberty and it's not like he went there or anything so i, I know that's there's very like specific and weird like yeah that's it this is what you're getting yeah so it was that one definitely. I mean, there were so many on there that I was like, "Oh, I should listen to that one." But that one, I was like, "Oh yes, I want to hear about this." <laughs> yeah, and the funny part is actually, if you Google Jack Hiles, which is like their main, one of their main guys, uh, we are on the first page, and we actually get a ton of our traffic to our website through that Google search. Amazing. So I'm uh, going to add a link at the top of that landing page that says like if you're suffering religious abuse or if you'd like to escape a religious environment please contact us today um 
So one, that'll piss them off even more, but two, Perfect. Uh, that will hopefully, you know, hopefully if, even if only one person ever responds to it and we help them, that's one Absolutely. more person that we were able to help, you know? Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's, that's why I, that's why I listened to that one first, because I was like, man, I grew up in it and it was, you know, like my experience with it was just like, it, it actually helped me just watching everybody in, in my environment. I grew up in small town, Ohio, and everyone was just like, hey, we're good on Sundays, and then just did whatever the fuck they wanted for the rest of their lives. And just and like- And that's how it is. And then they think they're superior for some reason, just because they go to this one place on a Sunday and maybe yeah. give them 10% of their salary. They're like, no, I'm going to heaven and everybody else is going to burn. Right. And I, I, it's like, I can't, I could never wrap my, hand, my head around religion. Yeah, it was- <laughs> It was, like I said, I think it was good that it showed me that, that it was like, okay, well, you're saying these one these things, and these are your ideals, and this is what your your book tells you, okay? I get that. Like, any religion, love and acceptance, that's where it goes, yeah. right? I mean, it starts the bottom line of all of them. That's, you know, from, from everything I've seen. And then I'm like, where the fuck does it, it, it just goes everywhere else from there. It's like, oh, I hate yeah. this person because they're not this or that, or, you know, like, anything that's different it's all about control and power yeah at the end of the day totally i've always said that if you are a religious person i don't care like i think religion at its root could be a good thing however it's so built up and such a show and a theater that it turns into a corrupt system of control and manipulation yes well and i mean Without like going too deep into politics, I mean, it, it showed its ass real bad this th- this voting cycle. You know, it's like yeah. how like okay, you know, I always say like George Bush didn't like his politics, but if you had told me like that man goes to church, I'm I'm on board. I'll be like, yeah, sure, okay, I can see that, right? The Bush family, they probably are churchgoers. Yeah. Then you the they're like evangelicals jumping on board with this guy, and I'm like, come, like stop. <laughs> you have to think about how much money evangelicals are making. So, of course, they're like, oh, no, this is the great guy because Trump was all about making sure the people who had money maintained the money. So they're like, no, this is the holy savior. You have to of uh, course. understand that. Well, and I mean, as as ridiculous as it is, like when I saw him starting to do his push for reelection, he started talking about guns, prayer. And he just had these little key words that were just the ones that they needed to hear of like, and, you know, obviously abortion was in there, you know, of course. So it was like, you could wrap those three in there and you're hooked. Like, you don't have to say anything else. You could do anything else. You got those three and that's it. And I was just like, yeah, exactly. It's because that's, that's the lie that they've built up and the religious, right. We were going to get real deep if we don't be careful, but (laughs) (laughs) the religious right really uh, got into politics in the Reagan administration. And you see the rise of the IFB, which, um, now largely controls a big portion of the Midwest, including Indiana, which is uh, where Evan and I both grew up. Ah, okay. um, but um, where was I going with that? Yeah, they, they just really got in there and they got a root and it happened in time before the internet when people were vulnerable. There wasn't, there was a big uh, groups of people. Um, it was a way to make everybody feel better about themselves. And then it just got worse and worse and worse. Yes. Yes. I, I <laughs> I have listened to so much about that and that that is so true. But that's a very good segue to go into what so you grew up in Indiana. What was what was what was life like growing up? So, I actually grew up in a um extremely progressive family and I wouldn't say progressive in the fact of like super liberal or anything like that, but um when I came out there was no issues or anything like that Beautiful. and um you know, it was very much like like my grandma um, and my grandpa before he passed would always talk about how stupid Donald Trump was. So, like, you know, they I was very fortunate to have that kind of uh, family in that area because had my family grown up um, and raised me conservative, I probably would have a lot more issues than I do today. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> going to say self-acceptance and like things like that. Yeah, no, I, I love hearing that because when you said Indiana, that was my first thought was like, oh, shit. 
Yeah, Evan, my uh, co-host and best friend, actually grew up in the IFB, which, I mean, you listen to the podcast, so yeah. you've heard that, but I was definitely very fortunate that I didn't have to face that abuse. Yeah, that is so fortunate, too. I mean, um, and like you said, even even though it wasn't, like, su- super, like, progressive or, like, you know, it was like, left-wing, it was just, at least it was accepting. At least it had, you know, like, you didn't have that you know, when you came out, like I've heard so many horror stories about that, where it's like people my age, I'm 35 that are still like hiding their, their true identity from their parents, you know? And it's like, yeah, absolutely. And I know people that have gone through that. And that's part of why I love my podcast so much, because we do get reviews from people all over the world, like China, Ireland, you know, name it we've gotten probably a review from there they're just saying like thank you you've helped me come out and just knowing that i mean we have fun doing it yeah like our of course we do is a, a you know it's fun it's a hobby what i love to do it full time is like a career sure but right now we're doing it for fun and just knowing that we're helping people while having fun is like the best feeling in the world absolutely and i can a hundred percent say like just from not knowing you all but just hearing you all interact and you just it sounds so much fun you know and like me i have so so much fun like this is just starting into a hobby for me as well and of course i would love to have it for you know forever and ever and do this for you know to make a make some money and that would be amazing but i just love telling people stories or letting people tell their stories you know and having good conversations with people because i i remember my story was kind of crazy like a little over two years ago, I was dying from liver failure, from drinking myself to death. And then I, I told my story and I, I had people reaching out and just saying like how powerful it was or like just those little instances where I didn't even know I was making a difference and I had just said something or just shown myself to be this person. And just hearing those little details of like, man, that really helped me. I was like, yeah, I would love to. I would love to do that. So I started the Beautifully Human as a as a as a blog, just sending questions out to people, and then it was it started growing. And I was like, I want to have these conversations, you know. So <laughs> I, I'm super happy that you're on here, and I I love that 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 is that is that is so cool that you're getting those responses from all over the world. That has to be just like obviously what it's for and what what makes you keep doing it is just helping those those people. Well, yeah, when we first started, um, so I'm actually extremely public with like things I've uh, faced and the fact that I have bipolar disorder and things like that, because I think it's extremely important to uh, share that information because um, the first time I read something written by somebody with like bipolar disorder, I'm not going to go into that now, but first time I read something, something written by somebody else with bipolar disorder, um, I was like, wow, okay, so that all makes sense. There are other people like me. I'm not only the crazy person on the TV that, you know, they put on there for 30 seconds in a mental institution. Like, right. just seeing things like that I, made me really decide that I was going to be extremely public uh, with my life because everybody faces struggles. And just reading that message from somebody else, you're like, okay, I'm not alone. Somebody else is in this with me, and I can. I have somebody to relate to and I don't feel so ostracized, but, um, yeah, the reason we started the podcast was actually to kind of lightly explore queer history. It was not, we didn't start it as a joke, but we started it very lighthearted in our first few episodes. If you listen to them, please don't, um, <laughs> <laughs> I pretty got awful. Uh, but you know, then we kind of started learning and we we're like, wow, there's so much we don't know. And there's so much that nobody knows that, people weren't taught and what can we share? What can we research? What can we educate people on? That's going to really bring the queer community to the forefront of the conversation. And then uh, we went from there. (laughs) Yeah. We've grown a lot. That's so good. I love that. And how long ago did you start it? We will be three years old in June. Beautiful. I love that. So like two and a half, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what a time to, you know, as you said, like over the last three years, I mean, that that is a time when we have needed those voices and, you know, ha- having people that are just speaking openly about it and, and helping people to come out and feel comfortable. I mean, 
in a time when, you know, it's everything is just being attacked and attacked and because it's different and this and, and you know, it's it, I think that's so important. So, mm-hmm. and, exactly. I, <laughs> and I mean, especially around the world, I know you, you all were talking about Poland on that the podcast I was listening to. And I was in Poland earlier this year. It seems like it feels to me like it was 40 years ago because of the year it's been. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I. I didn't, you know, I just didn't know what was happening. And then I heard about it and I was just thinking, holy shit, man, how the fuck are we still in this? Like, how is this even a fucking issue still? You yeah. Know? And that's, that's another reason why we continue to do it because even in the United States, people don't realize that once you step out of the East coast or the West coast and maybe a few couple liberal states sprinkle them out, once you go into a conservative state like Indiana, it's an entirely different country. Yeah. Um, like Mike Pence is from Indiana. They passed a law that set in Indiana that said um, you can use religion as an excuse, as a defense. So you can deny rights, you can deny privileges. They just took a case to the Supreme Court that denied same-sex couples uh, to have both their names on birth certificates and things like that. So, like, it's still today in 2020 happening. It's not yeah. an event. It's not something that was finished in 1969 with Stonewall. You know, it's a right. It's a ongoing fight, and um, we need voices and we need leaders. So we're doing our best to provide some some form of both you know (laughs) yeah yeah and i mean i tell people that all the time where they don't understand like how 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 did the states get to where they are and i was like dude like you got to think about it chicago is in illinois miami is in florida you know new york is in new york new york city's in new york like even portland and seattle who are very liberal it's like but you go to oregon and you go to washington i mean my partner and i drove around in we bought a van during quarantine and just kind of stayed to ourselves out in the middle of nowhere. And we drove around and we went through these small towns and yeah, I mean, I always use where I grew up in Ohio and it was, it was horrible and it's still, you know, it it hasn't, it hasn't, I mean, there is some progression, you know, just because of people standing up and, you know, using their voice, but I mean, it hasn't progressed a ton. You know, and it's not right. done. It's by no <laughs> means like, hey, it's all good. You know, it, uh, on the surface, it appears to be pleasant. But when you start digging deep and peeling the layers of the onion back, you discover an entirely different story. And um, a lot, I don't want to say a lot of it is not hate. There is definitely a, a level of ignorance involved. And I'm not using ignorance to like uh, talk badly about people, but I'm using it as its definitive word that they just don't know. Yeah. And um, they, like in Northwest Indiana, for example, um, you know, I went to a school that was equally uh, black and white and um, Hispanic. So I grew up in a very diverse school, but all of my parents and their friends all grew up in schools that were primarily white. So they don't know any different you know everything is fine to them so why do we have to have these protests because they don't see right the other side of the story because they've never been exposed to it and that is the problem that's why when you go into cities you see how progressive they are because everybody's exposed to different kinds of people but when you're in the midwest and you have two thousand people in your town and all of them are white farmers why would you need black lives matter they just don't get it yeah exactly and I mean, I had this, I, I try to stay off Facebook. I try to just not get in there because I get really upset and I try to change things. And then I'm like, I just have to realize like people are where they're at and I can say things and like, it is what it is. But there was one point when um, this kid from my hometown was asking or said something about this country being so great. And I was like, do you, you have to understand that like, we cannot be self-proclaimed as great. We To be great, we have to be great to everyone like we have to be great to the to the littlest nations we have to be great to our people we have to be great to everybody we can't just say hey we're great and you know then then it's all good we have to fully be great and he's like what do you mean and i he he was like i was like you have to understand what everybody else in the world is saying about this country and he was like well what are they saying and i was like well here's like six of my experiences, because I, I am fortunate enough that I get to travel a lot, you know, for work and just it's what I love to do. So I do it. And when I travel, 
I love meeting people. Like as much as I love seeing the new places I go, much more of it is the people that I get to meet in those little places. And mm-hmm. I ask, you know, I I always ask like, do you feel comfortable going to to my country? You know. And a lot of people are just scared to even come here because they don't speak English well enough. And I'm sitting here to them going, you speak English better than 70% of the people from our country that can't even speak it correctly. Right. You know, it's disgusting that somebody would make fun of somebody speaking English as a second language when they can't even say three words in a second language. Exactly. Like, yeah. What do you, <laughs> how is that? How can you use that to tell somebody that they're unintelligent? Right. Or I don't know. You know, like you, they're literally speaking a second language and you can't even you would say hola you know like <laughs> right yeah exactly yeah and you know like so many people it's third even more than second it's like third fourth whatever you know like right and yeah to think that like people out there are just seeing that and of course like you know that's just like the biggest boldest people are out there being the most ignorant and you know whatever but like I finally just was like, well, here's, here's what I've seen. And he was like, oh, wow. And I'm sitting there going like, yeah, because you don't think about it in your small little town that, you know, you don't, you, have, to you, you don't have to think about that. But like all, yeah, like you said, like the protest, it's all, you know, like everybody's anti this, but yeah, because you're in a, in a, an all white farmer community in Ohio, you don't have to think about that. And it's like, you have to think beyond your your life there is you know like right. there, there are, are other, other people with other experiences and other backgrounds in this country besides yeah. what you're familiar with yeah and and you know like i think i think the thinking that really just blows my mind with that is probably that like oh well it only exists in this little bubble right you know not like hey you know in budapest life is still happening literally at this second you and i are communicating mm-hmm. but like everywhere else in the world life is happening there's there's all right. these complex people in the world that are that are existing right now that we may never know but that that it doesn't mean that they don't exist and that they aren't important you know and like right. everybody right. else have their own story. yeah like there's this word that i love and it comes up pretty much every podcast of mine because it just goes this way because it's what i'm trying to get out is that you know everybody's story is so important but there's a word that is sonder S O N D E R. And the the meaning of it is that like if I'm looking out my window and there's someone walking their dog out there or there's someone driving a car going by or you know you in in the screen that I'm looking at every person that plays even a blip on the background of your life you may never know them you might never know what their name is or anything but that person has just as complex just as in depth they have people that love them they have dreams they have goals they have sufferings they have they have literally everything that you have in your life so why would you ever not respect that person exactly and that is uh i was reading a psychology book and they were uh that basic it basically said the same exact thing and it said that most people develop the ability to understand that after their toddler age so (laughs) yeah a lot of people have a lot of maturing to do (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, in, in your growing up or any, and how, like, what did you have, I'm sure you had some experiences where you were just like, what the fuck growing up or even in your adult life? Um, growing up, I actually went through some pretty, um, abusive experiences yeah uh i was never like physically abused or anything like that but i my mom had a uh, boyfriend who would uh kind of terrorize me and my sisters uh smoked meth in the house so Yikes. any type of meth induced rage i'm sure you could at least from tv or whatever understand <laughs> yeah um you know he would smash things scream at us um and uh yeah so we went through that um, and that also kind of helps me, uh, to be more me, I guess, to be more loud because there are people who go through things like that. And a lot of times it's not talked about and that, 
you know, when you're not talking about something, it's a big secret. And if something's a big secret, it builds on you and you are like a victim. But when you kind of tell your story and own it, it makes you more of a survivor, at least in my opinion. And I think the ability to share stories uh, really, it makes my life a lot easier, you know, now that I'm so public about everything that I've went through it, I feel totally free and yeah. I don't feel like I'm worried about anything or hiding anything. I'm like, it's all right there. Go, right. You know, go see what you want to see. <laughs> yeah. 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 Get to know me. I'm, I'm out, I'm out here. This is me. This is my shit. Let's, let's yeah. talk about it. You know? And I, I, I truly, I, I think that's, I know that's the only way to be, you know, cause like I literally was on my deathbed like 29 months ago and you know, the last thing I was thinking about was like possessions and this and that. It was like, what did, what was my mark that I left on this world? You know? And like, mm-hmm. as I've moved forward and away from that and I've, I've gotten to be who I am again and, you know, relearned how to be myself. I mean, that was what was truly important was like, I'm going to be me. I'm not going to hide anything anymore because what's the point? Like I have so many friendships and relationships that, that are just so surface and it's like, why are we just doing that? It doesn't do right. anybody any good just to be like, hey, cool, we know each other. Like, I've known you for 30 years, but I, do I? Do I? Know? Right. Like, That's why I always <laughs> say I have like four friends in this world. Because yeah. if you're my, if I call somebody a friend, that means I've been completely vulnerable with you. You know that I've been through trauma. I'm comfortable telling you all the crazy shit I did during a bipolar high, you know? Yeah. Like, if you're my, if I call you my friend, then you know me to my core. Yeah. And I think that is why I have so few friends, not because I'm scared to share that information with people, but I just don't think most people, at least that I've met, would uh, be willing to also be that vulnerable with me. Right. And in my opinion, to build a true intimate friendship, not intimate sexually, but intimate, yeah. <laughs> you know, closeness, you have to be able to um, share and take care of each other. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's such a such a weird stigma of, of just like people not being able to let themselves be that vulnerable, you know, mm-hmm. or, or just like not letting or, or you say something. I was on a Zoom call the other night and I I'd said something about um, my relationship with my parents or actually it was, we were joking and then they were talking about drinking stories. So I told my drinking stories and I got some crazy mm-hmm. fucking drinking stories to the point where I almost died from it. And so I said that, yeah. you know, just kind of like as a joke and they were like, Oh, that was a real downer. And I was like, well, but also like if I can't sit here and a joke about it or talk to you about it, like if I'm thinking about it and I need to talk to you, then like, it's some big secret you have to carry. And then you feel uncomfortable, like you're awkward or you're weird. Yeah, right. I totally get it. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, oh, yeah, sorry I brought the mood down. Like, it is what mm-hmm. it is, man. Like, you know, it's it's part of me. Like, it's never not going to be. And I'm not on a soapbox, right. but I want to be there for people. Because if and you're you sitting... About it, yeah, and you've grown, and, you know, you can share that now. Yeah. That's something that's very important. Yeah, and I'm like, obviously, like if you're talking about drinking nonstop, then I'm going to say, Hey, this is what happened to me. Not as like you're headed that way, but also if you, if you feel you are come say something, I'll talk to you. I I gladly, gladly, gladly talk to you about that. You know, my uh, co-host Evan is actually sober and I went with him through the entire journey from, um, I'm not going to share all of his information. He's publicly shared it on the podcast, but I went through all of, you know, his ups and downs and um, he jokes about it to, the, to this day, you know, all yeah. the crazy shit he did. And I think it's just, you have to be able to own your truth and, and make light of it. Otherwise it's just going to eat you alive. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's, you just embrace the power in it, you know, like, exactly. It, it's life, you know, it, it's what brought me to where I am today, you know, mm-hmm. like it totally is, you know, I, I was on a really crazy path and then I took a different way. I mean, I smashed into a wall, then took a different path, but you know, <laughs> hey, sometimes you got to break a hole in the wall to get through, right? Yeah, exactly. To make it to the other side. Um, so, uh, one of the questions I have on my, on my sheet that I didn't send you is what, what brought you to where you are in life today? Oh, God. 
so much. <laughs> it is a what broad one. Where, what brought me to where I am today? Um, a desire to help people. Um, a lot of marijuana. Uh, <laughs> my uh, great relationship with my fiance and just a drive to do better and to help as many people as possible. Like I just really want everybody to have the privilege of feeling as great about themselves as I do. And not yeah. to say like, I'm like, I feel like I'm the best person in the world or anything like that, but I accept who I am and I'm happy with who I am. And if I don't like something about myself, I work on changing it. Yeah. So I just want other people to feel as confident as I do, I guess. And by sharing my podcast and teaching people about uh, the fact that queer people have been in the world literally ever since man started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I hope that for those people who might feel that they're still an outcast or they feel weird that they have somebody they can relate to and they have a source that they can listen to and say, Hey, I'm not as weird as I thought, because yeah. if I had something like the podcast that I produced today, I think I would have had a lot of an easier time coming out and accepting myself. I never really had a problem accepting that I was a gay, but I, that I was gay, but that doesn't mean that I was always comfortable being gay, Sure, especially being in Indiana. It took a long time for me to, you know, not really give a fuck what other people think. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, how, how was your, like you said that it wasn't, it was, it was well, well recepted from your, your parents. So mm -hmm. how, how it was your coming out? Was it, it, so it was pretty good then. Yeah, it was, I mean, overall, it really didn't affect me. My, um, my, uh, mom didn't, care my stepdad didn't care like nobody cared um i did prior to coming out have a therapist that i talked to who i said that i thought i was um bisexual because that's like the easiest way to come out gay first come on sure <laughs> uh but he did tell me like oh maybe you're just confused maybe you haven't thought about it so that did put me back a couple of years but yeah. when i came out it was generally overall accepted um i was not i was like a straight believe it or not, straight presenting is the term gay. And I would uh, try not to be that gay guy, you know? I didn't want to be the one who would talk about pride and things like that. I tried to hide it. I tried to be gay, but not be publicly, publicly gay, sure. I guess would be the way to describe it. Um, and that was just due to the fact of where I grew up and there was a lot of shame around being gay and people. I was actually told by... Um, someone that I was pretty close with that, oh, you're gay, you're going to get AIDS. It's only a matter of time, but you're eventually going to get it and die. That's what happens. Wow. So, you know, that type of environment yeah. um, is what I grew up in. But moving to the East Coast, I was exposed to a lot more um, pride and a lot more people just living freely and however they wanted. So now I don't really care. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I don't think I can hide it very well. Sure. So I just, <laughs> I go about my life and I am who I am. And if you like me, you like me. And if you don't, you don't. Yeah. Man, I just, that just, it doesn't shock me that someone said that to you, but it just, it's so ridiculous to me that that is still just like, oh, you're gay. Have you, did you hear about AIDS? That's, that's your, that's what you're going to get. You're going to have that. Yeah. Like this is your life. Like eventually <laughs> it'll happen. And and uh, we actually talk a lot in our podcast about how the queer community is reduced to uh, sexuality. And that's why uh, the stereotype about the queer community is like, oh, the gays, they just have all these crazy orgies and things and blah, 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 which may not be false, but also <laughs> it's uh, that way because the, um, the straight Christian community of our country and the straight Baptist community of our country have basically said, oh, you're gay. That's what your life is. So you grow up not knowing any different. You don't have any role models. You don't have any people to be like, I want to be like that person when I grow up. So that's what I hope to give people. I love that. I love that. That actually, wow. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, so in that, in that, did you, I know you said you, you, you didn't have that. Did like, was there anybody out there that you were like, 
you know, even even when you were kind of like not out yet, but kind of knowing, mm-hmm. was there was there someone you were looking up to, or like was there so someone? The only person I had on TV was Kurt from Glee. <laughs> that was the only represent. I mean, there was Will and Grace, but sure, was, that was before my time, and I was a little too young to get the jokes you know maybe i could watch it now and get it but yeah like kurt from glee was my only um person that i could see on tv at a regular time that had a regular life um i don't think i really took him as a role model but i kind of saw that and i was like hey there are people like me out there yeah okay yeah all right um so how did how did you meet your fiance oh my god so i moved to the east coast in june this June. Uh, oh, sorry. No. East Coast June <laughs> six years ago. I, I was should have elaborated. That's all right. June six <laughs> years ago. Seven years ago. I don't remember. It's been too long. <laughs> um, and I was actually living with my best friend, Evan. Um, he had moved out a year earlier. And he at the he he is a trans man, so at the time he was living as a lesbian. He's also public about that. So nobody sent me any hate for yeah. having him. Um <laughs> Um, and he invited me to a party. He said, Hey, there's this lesbian party happening at this, uh, um, dessert bar. And it's just a a fun thing. And I said, I don't want to go to a lesbian party. That sounds absolutely horrible. I'm sure there's (laughs) going to be lots of loud music and angry people. I'm not interested. (laughs) So then (laughs) he gets there, they would actually be dressed similar to you. Um, (laughs) perfect. (laughs) But he, he gets there. And he messaged me and says, hey, it's not a lesbian party. It's actually, um, you know, there's all types of people here. There's gay people here and blah, blah, blah. And I was in the on the couch in my pajamas with, like, way more unshaved than this. And I was like, fine, I'll come. I dragged my ass and took as long as possible to get there because I did not want to go there. Um, and when I arrived, it turns out it was speed dating. Oh, not shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he was like, no, it's fine. There's people at the bar. You can go and have a drink. You don't have to sit at the tables. And I walk in. Nobody's at the bar. Everybody's at a table. Oh. So I was like, fuck, I have no interest <laughs> in this. I'm super introverted, super shy. This is the worst case scenario for me. But I walked up and I went and I sat at a table in the corner. And some random man came across from me. Um, and I, I wasn't interested. You know, we just had a nice conversation. But apparently there was like some rotation or something that they were supposed to follow. Like you start here, then you go to the next table. I had no idea. I showed up 10 minutes before it was over. Classy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I just got up from my table and I walked directly from one end of the room to the other end of the room because I wanted to see if maybe there was somebody I wanted to sit across from. So my friend Evan is sitting at this table and he actually points to my fiance and says, he's really, really cute. Go talk to him. And of course, shy and introverted, I was like, absolutely not. I'm yeah. going to go sit at this empty table by myself. Uh, he came and sat across from me. We talked, went to a bar after, and we've been together ever since. I so, love that. Long story, but it has a real nice ending. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And man, the second you said speed dating, I that just makes me cringe, too. I've never done I it. Cringe. <laughs> but no, I just can't. I would never have ever, ever, and if I was told from the start that I was speed dating, I would not have went, for yeah. sure. But he was also tricked by another lesbian who ended up being a friend of mine. They said it was a, ne- a social, because he was running a nightclub night at the time. So they told him it was a social, like, outing, basically. Uh, okay. So we both got tricked into going to speed dating, and here we are all these years later. So try it if you're single. <laughs> hey, why not? I mean, in this, this, you know, in this time, who knows? I mean, I... I haven't had to date in a long time, but I remember, I mean, being in my thirties and dating and it was just so strange. You know, I never mm-hmm. tried speed dating, but it was just, it, it was weird <laughs> with all yeah, the apps and all this other shit. <laughs> I never want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I love that. And you know, it's, it's one of those that's, that's in life, you know, it's like, if I didn't do this, if I didn't do this, if I didn't do this, then I don't you know. know where I'd be today because he has helped me grow so much. We just both grew up in such totally different environments. And when I met him, he was and still is a drag queen. So that yes. got me out in the events and in, in public. And it brought me and, you know, I got to go behind the scenes and all the bars, all the backstages and things. It was really 
cool and it really helped bring me out of my shell a little bit i'm still super shy but you know yeah. <laughs> at least now i had an n right because i totally. had this connection I'm, oh i'm with this person yes man drag shows are so fun I they absolutely really love them. And that's another mm-hmm. one that I think people get so scared of. And I'm just like, do you just, do you love having a good time? Do you love, like, do you just want to go have fun mm-hmm. with nothing else on the plan? It's just have a really and, awesome time and see people living laugh. a beautiful <laughs> life. Go to a drag show. You'll yeah. laugh and you will dance. Of- yeah, I was just going to say a lot of people are like scared. They think they're maybe like freaks or like um, to use an outdated and offensive term, they'll call them like transvestites. Like they just don't get it. Right. But I always tell people it's the same thing as a magician or a clown. They put on their outfit, they do their performance, they take it off and they're normal people just like you and me. Yeah. It's just completely an act. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's an illusion. It's fun. They're having a good time. They're making fun of a lot of pop culture and just being wild and silly. And their whole job is to make you laugh and party. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Every single one I've ever been to and every performer I've met, has just, it's just been such an enriching and experience you know like there was that show we we are here i think it was did you ever see that it was on hbo it was uh, a few um a few drag queens were go- would go into smaller cities like branson missouri that were they were there and they would find three locals who were interested in doing it and not like that they had like ambition to do it i don't think but they brought some people in to kind of like break down the walls and be like this is what it is and man by the end of it they would put on a show and i mean i cried every single episode because it was just so beautiful you know like there's something so empowering about being fully in a character where you can be as wild and as free as you really are but aren't able to do on a public level on a day-to-day basis yes Yes. I, yeah, exactly. That I couldn't have said it better. Could not have said mm-hmm. it better. So um, who proposed to who and how, how was the proposal? So he proposed to me uh, actually New Year's Eve when the ball dropped. So it'll be our one year engagement anniversary in a couple of days. Uh, uh, that's amazing. And, <laughs> and it was at a gay bar surrounded by our friends. I turned around and turned back and there was a ring. So it was just it was super cute, super fun, you know, nothing dramatic and over the top, but it couldn't have happened in a better environment where we were able to just be ourselves. And, um, I don't remember much after the proposal because of course everybody was buying a shots, but well, yeah, you start off on that high and then you start taking the shots and then it just, yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. That's so cool. Do you, um, when is there plans for a wedding coming up or? So we actually were going to get married this year. Okay. Obviously that didn't happen. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm trying to push for July just because my family generally comes and visits around July. So I think it'd be really easy to get everything together. Yeah. Um, But there's that fear of, is everybody going to be vaccinated? Are people going to be able to travel by then? Because right. we don't want a COVID wedding. Right. Um, we want everybody to be able to eat and have fun and dance. And, right. you know, you can't do that with the mask on and six feet apart. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's I've, I've had a lot of people with the, the well, we're pushing it to next year. Pushing yeah. it, pushing it. Yeah. So, and. Exactly. Man. Um, all right. So here's a question for you. If there were no travel restrictions and then you could go anywhere and there's no COVID, mm-hmm. if I handed you a plane ticket to anywhere in the world, where would you go? I would go to London to meet my friend Becca. Um, we met on a game called Habo Hotel. Don't know if you've ever heard of it. It was like a virtual chat room for teens where you could have a little avatar and you like decorated your room and stuff. So we met on there when I was 12. Um, and she was also 12, maybe she was 11 or 13. We're like pretty much the same age. Um, and it was just a chance meeting. We happened to both be in, I don't even know how we met. We were both probably in like the same room and just started chatting. And, um, yeah, we've been in and out of contact for the last 16 years, but we've always kind of been there for major like life events. So, um, her dad recently passed. So I I reached out, you know, I've been in communication with her about that. Um, 
And yeah, so she's just a really good friend who I've never met once in my life in person, but we've stayed in contact for 16 years. I hope she comes to my wedding and yeah, I, one day I'd like to meet her. <laughs> That's incredible. It's like a digital pen pal. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's so cool. Have you been to London before? No, I've uh, never. I've been out of the United States, but only on a cruise. So I've gone to like St. Martin and the Bahamas and things like that. Um, but I would love to go to London. I've gone to Puerto Rico, but that's part of the United States, so that doesn't count. <laughs> that's still pretty. Um, it's still cool, though. Yeah, yeah. I would love to go to London. She also goes a lot to um, uh, Switzerland, I think. So I'd love to go there. I I just I love to travel. Like uh, you said, I haven't been in a place where I could travel until now. So I think starting 2021, once things lift, traveling is going to be a big uh, goal of mine. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I work in the music industry, so I, I've been traveling for the last 14 years doing that. So I've, I've been very, very fortunate to, to be able to see a lot of, see a lot of places and get paid for it, which is awesome. But you know, Also, in the way of traveling, it's I I see the venue and then I see a bar next door or, you know, whatever. So I've seen a lot of places in very small portions, (laughs) right? (laughs) which is still cool. But like, I think when people see what I'm doing and they're like, oh, you're just traveling bands, you're doing all this. And I'm like, I've been to some places 30 times, but I've seen five block radiuses, you know, I haven't truly explored. So, you know, that's why, like, when I'm done touring for a year not this year, I go travel, you know, I always have people when I'm on tour and they're like, what do you do when you're, when you're off work? And I, I just go travel. Cause then I can do it on my own <laughs> terms. I get to go experience what I want to experience, you know? Right. Yep. That's, I've only been on one cruise and I probably won't take another one just because you dock at an Island, you get eight hours on that Island. And I'm like, I want to go to a native like thing. I want to go and have fun. I don't want to get off the Island. I want to spend three days on the Island at least, you know? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. My, my partner and I, we worked on um, some cruises that were doing like it was, they were called festivals at sea. So it was concerts going on on the cruises. So that was my first time on a cruise ship. And yeah, it was, it was definitely like, it was good to see those places, but yeah, it was like, okay, let's find this beach and like take, a couple mile walk to this beach and then like you get there and then it's like, cool, an hour. Okay. We turn around just in case, especially because we were working too. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, then I remember one time we started a conversation with this just absolutely beautiful woman. She was making us, um, some sort of like macaroni salad or something. And it was just like, and then red beans and rice. And we were talking to her and I was like, I had to do the, like, look at my phone and go, God damn it. We got to go. And I was just like, Mm -hmm. I just want to sit here and be like, tell me all your stories. Let's just chat. Like, I got nowhere to be. Talk to me. Tell me your stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We actually had for uh, the beginning of this year in May, we had a 10-day trip booked in Costa Rica. We actually had a house in the jungle, like in the jungle, in the jungle, or the rainforest, whatever it is. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, But we had it, and I was so excited um, pictures of the place. There was like monkeys on the porch and coming up on the house. Like I was like, this is my dream. This is where I want to go. And then it got canceled. Luckily everything got refunded because I said, I'm not canceling my trip. I'm still going unless you force me to not go. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Yeah. So, well, that's an experience. At least you got your money back on it. I know the experience would have been far better than money because we could all make money. That's the one one good thing about a greedy society is that there's always money to be yes. made out there. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. A couple more questions for you. One is what brings you hope? What brings me hope? History. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have given you that answer three years ago, but I have read thousands of pages and books and watched countless videos of how horrible things have been in the past. Um, The AIDS epidemic, for example, thousands of people just dropping dead left and right, people uh, dying and there's no hope. But at the end of the day, something has to give and progress is made and things get better. So without knowing history so well, I might 
constantly live with anxiety even worse than I do. But yeah, I know that something always has to give. Somebody has to change something and progress is always moving forward. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, if I can answer that quickly, like <laughs> hanging out and speaking speaking to you gives me hope, you know, just that there are people out there that are standing for for who they are and, and what they believe in and, you know, just using that voice like that, that truly gives me hope that progress will be made to to educate the people that need to be educated and do it in a good way of like not saying like, well, you're fucking stupid. Here's why. It's like, right. here's here's life. This is, yes, it might be different from something you know, but like, it it's not a bad thing. It's it's good to learn. It's good to adapt. Right. It, like, I'm, I'm a person. I have these struggles. I have this no different, you know, maybe different from you, but like, you have your struggles. I have my struggles. Let's right. kick the other shit exactly. out of the way and let's let's be there for each other like i love i love i i I just feel that from you of like i just want to be there for you i want to talk about these things i want to like get in in depth with you about these things like i stayed in boise on our, our trip um for a month with a friend of mine who i didn't know well we worked on a tour with him last summer and he was gracious enough to let us stay at his house with his wife and he was on the opposite side of of politics and you know i i would just sit there and i would pick i would pick and be like just tell like i i have you know we can all get into our own bubbles in life right of like cool i got my people this is what we believe this is what we think this is who we accept and that's everybody so everybody is like that right obviously mm-hmm. not but i was like okay i do want to learn i do want these people i, I want to listen and talk to these people and say what why do you feel this way and i would and like it was always funny because his answers <laughs> most of the time i was just like oh my god dude like it was like well i recycle but i'm i'm a republican and i was like it's not a political issue <laughs> giving a shit about the world is is should be every that's creation a, ev- yeah every creationist should be massively a you know a hippie tree hugger because if god created this world then why are you shitting on it you know that's that's a pretty simple one so anyway i like you know i i was just listening to this and i was like okay i've listened to all that you've said thinking that it would be like oh okay so what do you think nick and it didn't swing back around and i was like okay but i'm i'm going to listen i want to be that person that listens like i want to speak to everybody on every side of the the issue just to see what's out there and share it, right? you know? And if you go to somebody and they have a belief, whether the belief is right or wrong, if you immediately come to them and say, you're stupid, you don't understand, you don't get it, they're going to get defensive. They're a human just like you. If somebody looked at you and said, you're stupid, you don't get it, you're going to get defensive no matter what the subject is, even if you are wrong. It's just a human reaction. Yeah. So that's why it, it always is important to approach subjects from an educational standpoint, um, rather than a political buzzword standpoint. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I just love, I love all the beauty and love and joy that you're putting out in the world. I felt it when I, when I've listened to your, you all's podcast, I'm laughing, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm learning so much, you know, which I'm very thankful to be learning so much, you know, to be a better ally, to be, to be there to uplift voices, you know? So I'm, I'm it was very important for us to make the podcast funny and we don't even necessarily try to be funny. We're just really close friends. So we have a lot of jokes and things. And yeah. We make light of situations simply because sometimes we are talking about such horrible subjects that if you don't make light of it, that's not going to be fun to listen to. Yeah. So you have to, make education fun and i think we've done a i'm gonna say i think we've done a pretty good job of that 100 percent. yes i i think so i've listened to a few episodes now (laughs) and i've i've learned a ton and you know it's topics that you know aren't the easiest obviously to to listen to and you know to know that that's still happening and you know to to be able to learn and laugh through the process and still sit there and go holy shit this has got to change you know that i think that's 
it's a really beautiful art that you've that you've you've created with that well not created but you that you've that you are creating the two of you mm-hmm. so i appreciate that it gives me hope i i love that that you two are using your voices in such a beautiful way thank you yeah all right last two um what would you want the world to know about you i actually um wrote this one <laughs> perfect <laughs> Uh, just a quick read. Okay, so I, when I am in public, I may come off as rude or like stone faced or con- not confrontational, but I oftentimes look like the person that you probably wouldn't want to talk to, and I probably won't start a conversation with you. And that's not because I'm like not a people person, it's simply because I have pretty bad social anxiety and I'm also super introverted. So, um, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I can look intimidating. I know how right. I look. I look so scary. Definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, if you get to know me, and if you come up to me and start talking to me, I'll talk to you. Um, there have been a few instances where, uh, after drinking to get more in the social mood, I may have had a little too much and forgot people that I've had conversations with them, and they came up to me, and I'm like, "Oh, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Paul." And they're like, we actually already met. So <laughs> that, you know, doesn't make me look too good. But I am super friendly. I just am pretty shy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had that happen many a times when I was drinking. They're like, I'm like, hey, I'm Nick. And they're like, oh, we know you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do know me. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Oops. My bad. My bad. <laughs> oh, all right. And, um, if you had the ear of everybody in the world, what would you say to them? Um, I would say that it is okay to be weird. It's okay to be loud. It's okay to be funny or awkward. You can be vulnerable, anxious, needy, lovely. Uh, it's okay to wear makeup. It's okay to wear dresses. It's okay to wear nails. It's okay to not fit into society. Um, from birth, we are trained to be human in a certain way. And we are all individuals who have our own goals and passions in life. And I think it's really important that everybody kind of stops and looks at themselves and says, what do I need out of life? What are my goals in life? Because if you're living for somebody else's goals and somebody else's um, life path, you are not going to be happy at the end of the day. And I'm very happy with the fact that I know on my deathbed, I will say that I've done everything I could have done to have been the best me I could have been so beautiful I love that that's such an important that's such an important message to everybody just be yourself whatever that may be let it and let you don't it. have to know what you are right now you can yeah. learn you can say you're one way one day and then a year later be totally different and that's okay yes don't box yourself in and yeah. grow as a person yes 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 absolutely man Paul this has been so lovely I, I appreciate you coming on and, and chatting and hanging out with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've had a good time. It was it was nice. I, I don't do many interviews, like I said, just because I'm so shy, but it was it was a good time. Yeah, I, li- I like that. I, I, I like doing the ones where I, I don't know the people either. So, you know, I get, I get that. I get that like, oh, what am I going to talk about? And then I'm like, I literally know pretty much zero about you. So if we can't find something to talk about for an hour, that's kind of like... It's kind of sad. That's kind of the problem. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I appreciate I appreciate your insight, and I just I appreciate you and and your voice and the power that you're putting out in the world. So I appreciate you yeah. coming out and you know telling telling your story and chatting with me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Well, have a beautiful rest of your day. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Beautifully Human podcast. To hear more beautiful stories from beautiful humans, follow us on Spotify and rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Wanderlust Moon Duo. Peace signs up.